In episode F19, we talked about Unified Diagnostic Services, or UDS for short. And when we did this, we highlighted some of the differences between UDS and the onboard diagnostic protocol that's specified in SAE J1979. Of course, we talked about that OBD protocol and OBD2 in general in episode F18. And at the very end of episode F19 about UDS, I did hint that UDS and OBD have started to converge again. What does that mean? Let's go find out. Hi everybody, I'm Ian Cunningham from Vector GB. Welcome to this foundation level episode of Engineering the Jigsaw, foundation episode number 20, OBD, UDS, what happened next? So, as an introduction and a very quick recap, we talked about in previous episodes how the J1979 protocol, which is used for OBD2, predates very roughly UDS by about 15 years. So it's quite a lot older. So J1979, the standard was published first in 1991, while UDS was first published in the guise of diagnostics on CAN in 2004. And of course, the, the formal UDS specification was published in 2006, so really 15 years after 1991. And in fact, nearly 20 years ago now, depending how you count it. So there are some quite big differences between J1979 and, and UDS. 15 years is quite a long time in terms of, of technical development. So if we think about J1979 and the, the ways we have of interacting with a vehicle and the ECUs within that vehicle, J1979 provides 10 modes or services, where in the case of UDS, at least the, the third edition, the most recent edition published in 2020, we have 26 services, which is a lot more than 10. And in fact, a number of those services have sub functions. So we can even think that they're kind of subdivided, giving us even more ways that we can interact with the ECUs in a vehicle. If we think about numbers, and in particular, things like the mass maximum possible number of, that we can assign to an identifier in J1979, that is 255. And that is because J1979 uses single bytes to represent identifiers. In the case of UDS, the number we can assign goes up to 65,535 because UDS uses two bytes for identifiers. Now, we'll keep that two byte number on the screen, but we'll slide it up to J1979 because we can have those 65,535 as the maximum number we can assign to a fault code or a DTC number in OBD um, context, in the context of OBD. I've forgotten my words. Um, with UDS, we can go bigger again. We can go to 16,777,215. And that is because UDS uses three byte numbers to represent our fault codes, our DTCs. So in general, we can say that J1979 is quite constrained in comparison to UDS, which is very flexible. And of course, if we think about 1991 versus uh, 2000s, the mid-2000s when UDS was first specified, there's some quite big differences there as, as, as well. And and we have to think that J1979 was developed in the context of what vehicles could do in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Whereas, of course, UDS was developed much later when vehicles could do more things. So let's think about a modern vehicle in particular. And of course, we, we now have, we're in the 2020s, so we're further on again. 
What can we think about a modern vehicle and its characteristics versus 1991? Well, firstly, there's a lot more processing power inside the ECUs that we have in the vehicle. We have more software. So we have more ECUs. In, in the early 1990s, we probably only had an engine management system, maybe a braking system in most cars. And then the radio was probably the limit of the electronics. It was only when we, as we got into the 90s that more and more ECUs came into vehicles, as we talked about in episodes F10 and F11. Of course, we have more kinds of data. With more software, we can get more kinds of data. But also, we have more emissions relevant components in a modern vehicle than in one of those much older vehicles. The engine is more complex, there are more things attached to it. Things like air conditioning systems, which were really not that common that in, at the time where OBD was first specified, are now much more common. And of course, the HVAC system, the, the air conditioning system, can present load on the engine, which can affect the emissions that the engine can, can create. So we have many more things like that. And a consequence of this is that the old OBD protocol has simply run out of space. So we, we've run out of standardized numbers that we can assign to things we want to be able to retrieve with OBD based on those numbers we talked about just now. This, of course, is a problem because we need OBD. It's for emissions relevant diagnostics. We want to understand whether vehicles are more polluting than they should be and to try to control that pollution. So after 30 years, we have convergence. So SAEJ1979 had a second part, part two, published in 2021. And this introduced the concept of OBD on UDS based on the third edition of UDS. And this means that if we have OBD on UDS in a vehicle, we have a single way to access all diagnostic data, whether it is our regulated diagnostic data or the data that we want to return for those non-emissions relevant systems. And it is required, SAEJ 1972, 1979 part two is required by the California Code of Regulations, Title 13, Section 1971.1 of the deadline of implementation of 2027, which in automotive industry terms is practically tomorrow. In fact, it is tomorrow because a number of vehicles actually are already in scope. 2027 is the latest for which all vehicles have to comply. So this is one form of convergence that we have in diagnostics that OBD data is now able to be retrieved via UDS. But what about electric vehicles? We haven't talked about them yet. What about the battery condition of an electric vehicle? That's probably quite important to know if we want to buy a second-hand electric vehicle or plug-in vehicle where it's got a battery that's being charged by plugging into the grid. Similarly, if we're plugging into the electricity grid, then we're causing emissions somewhere else quite likely because unfortunately the, the present situation is that not all of the electricity that is produced is produced from renewable energy sources and therefore there's a chance of some pollution being generated during the generation of electricity. And SAEJ 1979 Part 3 was published in 2022 to start to address this. So SAEJ 1979 Part 3 describes a subset of J1979 part two and some additional data that is required to be returned by plug-in vehicles. And it requires that plug-in vehicles return note that data as well. And the California Code of Regulations published by CARB, Title 13, Section 1962.5 requires all plug-in vehicles to support ZEV on UDS by 2028. And again, there's a, a phase in period that means that some vehicles will become subject to this new regulation earlier than that. So really, again, very soon in automotive industry terms. So as a summary, 
After many years of OBD and UDS providing different ways to access diagnostic data, they are converging. OBD on UDS describes how emissions relevant data may be accessed via unified diagnostic services and ZEV on UDS describes a subset of capability that's required for plug-in vehicles and some additional data relating to the, the system inside the vehicle that can uh, for the battery state of health and for grid emissions that may be caused during charging the, the vehicle from the electricity grid. If you want to know more information on these new OBD protocols, then please visit our website for details of the new OBD protocols and their support across Vector's products. And join us again for an episode in the future where we're going to talk about the next generation standard for service-oriented vehicle diagnostics or SOVD. So we have another episode planned for another diagnostics topic, which is a brand new standard, very recently published. If you've got some questions in the meantime, of course, let us know and any comments. Join us after the music to find out how. See you soon. Really hope you've enjoyed this episode of Engineering the Jigsaw. Make sure you, if you have, you give it a thumbs up in YouTube. If you have questions or ideas, then give us a comment down below the video. If you don't want to do it in public, if you want to keep it private, then drop us an email to our special email address, engineering.jigsaw at vector.com. You can find a link to a web page with those contact details on in the description for this video. Make sure that you subscribe to get notified as we release new episodes and as Vector publishes its excellent and informative videos on its YouTube channel. Make sure to check out our playlists. We have our foundation episodes playlist and also intermediate level playlist as well for you to binge and catch up with. We'll catch you for another episode soon. Goodbye.